Well, we're looking at amblyopia, and in the last video, we dealt with the main cause, which is uncorrected refractive error during the development of the visual pathway that takes place predominantly during that first five or six years of a child's life. It's thought that the visual pathway is fully established by the age of about eight, but those first five or six years are critical. Now, in this video, we're going to be looking at the subject of strabismus which is a very confusing subject because it relates to the mechanics of providing good binocular vision which is a very complicated subject and these videos are really designed to equip and help people working in rural communities in Africa to provide sort of very basic primary eye care services so there's a lot of stuff that's going to be associated with this subject that will won't be really relevant to that situation. So, but it's just good to have some understanding about what is going on because there will be times when you are presented with someone who is experiencing double vision, who have getting headaches or experiencing some degree of eye strain and in that situation the causes could well be to do with what we're talking about in this video which is to do with binocular vision and strabismus and tropias and phorias and so on. So we're going to be, I'm just going to be keeping it as simple as I can and just providing a bit of an overview of this whole subject. Now for the brain to provide us with good binocular vision those eyes, the images that it's getting from those eyes need to be as similar as possible. So that means that those eyes need to be working together as a team so that they share the same direction of gaze all the time. So when they're looking in the distance, the eyes are nice and parallel and they are looking at the same object. So they're working together as a team in unison. When they're looking at a near object, they both converge together. So again, that objective focus is shared between the two eyes. And therefore the brain can then make sense of the image because they are looking at the same thing. Now, the other the other aspect of this is that the eyes, the image, the retinal images of the that is um, being produced by those two eyes needs to be similar as well, and you know they need to be of similar size and similar clarity. And if that is happening, then we can enjoy good binocular vision. The brain can handle the information from those two eyes and deal with it and provide us with good vision. Now, the terminology used for the alignment of the eyes is called motor fusion. Motor fusion. And the terminology for the, the, the retinal image element is called sensory fusion. Right, so now if those eyes are looked at as being two separate entities so they're both not involved in, in providing binocular vision. When they're at a place of rest, quite often, those eyes will be pointing in a slightly different direction. Usually they are. So when they are in a position of rest, one eye is pointing one way and the other eye is just slightly off, maybe looking in a slightly different axis. The visual axis is slightly different. And that is relatively normal. And this is a condition that we call heterophoria. It's where the two eyes, when in a position of rest, have slightly different directions of visual axis. And that is quite common. So what has to happen in that situation is that the brain needs to be able to control, to some degree, that eye movement to bring them together to work as a team. And the same with the retinal images. If the retinal images are slightly off between the two eyes, the brain to some degree is able to cope with these differences and overcome them and make sense of the information that it's getting. Now that, that is called, the ability of the brain to deal with these little anomalies, that is called um, fusional reserves. So usually, the brain has enough fusional reserves to provide good motor and sensory fusion. Okay, so now when you have the situation where the eyes are not quite 
in line with each other. This is known as heterophoria. Heterophoria. And this is a very common condition. Most people have it. And there are two types of heterophoria. You have compensated, compensated heterophoria. And in this situation, the brain has enough fusional reserves to overcome the motor and sensory um, anomalies that exist. Okay, so the brain can manage it. So that is compensated heterophoria, and most people have that to some degree. You then got D compensated heterophoria. Okay, so there's one and that's two. Decompensated heterophoria is where you're on the brink. The brain is really struggling because its fusional reserves are not enough to cope with those slight anomalies that there are between the, the eye alignment. Okay, so this is a little... The symptoms on this will be eye strain and, and headaches and things like that. So, and maybe occasionally double vision as well. When those reserves just run out, sometimes that deviation becomes greater. Now with strabismus, we are looking at a wider angle of deviation. Wider angle of deviation. The, the angle of deviation is so wide that it is impossible to achieve good binocular vision. Now when this happens in a child, the child does have very good um, fusion reserves, very good fusional reserves, and quite often they can kind of overcome that to some degree. But quite often what will happen is that the brain will suppress the, the eye that's deviating the most, and then amblyopia will start to develop in that eye. Okay, so this is the type of strabismus that we are interested in, because we need to deal with that if we can, depending on what is causing the strabismus. And we'll go through the causes in a moment. So strabismus relates to a wide angle of deviation. Those, that is known as tropias, okay? These are phorias. So we've got tropias and phorias. And there are two types of tropias. You've got, you know, you've got tropias, and then you've also got microtropias, which are smaller, which are smaller angles of deviation. Okay, so these ones are very difficult to to eke out, and so you ha you have to do certain cover tests in order to um, expose these microtropias. They're less than five degrees of deviation. But the the wider angles of deviation, the main tropias, are, are usually fairly observable just by looking at someone. Now, these tropias may only manifest when the person is looking in a particular direction of gaze. So, for example, you can do a test on someone. If they come to you and they're experiencing sort of double vision and headaches and so on, you can do a quick, very quick sort of test just to check the alignment of the two eyes in different directions of gaze. So you just get them to follow your finger across and down and across and up and while they're following your finger you look at their eyes to see if there's any deviation manifesting during that process and that may expose a, a, a tropia that is manifest in a particular direction of gaze. So that's, that's one way of, of diagnosing a tropia in that situation. Quite often, tropias will only become manifest if they are sort of microtropias when you do a cover test. So you have to cover one eye, and you get them to look at a, an object, and then you cover one eye, and if, that is, uh, if, no, if there is no movement, you know that that is okay, and then you can cover the other eye, and if you see a, a bit of a movement there, then you, you know that there is a tropia present. So um, that is how you diagnose for these things. And there are other tests, but for the sake of this video, just trying to keep it simple, um, you know, I'm just sort of going through the, 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 the very basics of what we're dealing with. So you diagnose them with observation, cover test. With heterophoria, with this condition, um, quite often the only way to to find out if someone has a phoria is to do a cross-cover test, which is where you cover one eye and then you move your hand across or you move the occluder across so and then you cover the other eye and what you're doing there is you're breaking that fusion between the two eyes 
and then you can get this kind of little movement in one of the eyes so you keep looking at the the eye that's uncovered and you may see a little bit of a, a movement in that eye which would indicate that there is a foria present so those are the sort of means of diagnosing these things sometimes you can do a, a light reflex test you can shine the light into their into their eyes and the reflex will tell you if they have a squint Ideally, the, the reflex should be central to the pupil, but if you find that the reflex is descended in, then the, you know that they've got a, a squint, which is divergent, and if the reflex is, is uh, towards the temporal side of the pupil, then you know they have a convergent squint. So we're going to go through the different types of tropias now. But before I do that, I want to just go through some of the other background information. Strabismus can develop at any age. But generally speaking, usually it manifests itself during the early stages of the baby developing or in early childhood. Now it can be congenital, it can be inherited from previous generations. Usually babies are not born with a squint. It develops very quickly though within the first few weeks. And um, if, it's, if it develops within the first six months of a baby's life, then that is known as infantile strabismus but if it develops after that uh, after that six month period it's known as acquired strabismus and strabismus can be intermittent or it can be constant quite often when a baby is born you will see that um, there is some deviation between the two eyes which can last for the first couple of months as that eye is learning to focus and, and the, the uh, you know the mechanisms are all starting to develop and, and learn how to deal with um, focusing. So that is an intermittent form of strabismus. And sometimes people can uh, develop a, or manifest a squint when those fusional reserves run out, which is we we're talking about. Those fusional reserves can run out and all of a sudden a squint, a strabismus can be manifest in that situation because of tiredness and fatigue. So what was perhaps just a fourier develops into a strabismus at that point. So uh, as you can see, this is quite a, a complicated subject. So we're going to now look at what the causes might be. So I'm going to take all of this off the board and there are really three main causes of strabismus. Okay, the first one is the one that we would be more concerned about when we're doing optometry and that is um, hypermetropia, large degrees of hypermetropia. This is where the eye is very long sighted and because of that the, the, uh, the, the natural tendency of the eye is to employ those fusional reserves and to start accommodating like crazy to try and correct that hypermetropia. Unfortunately the reserves run out and they just haven't got enough and it's too much effort and what happens is the whole thing collapses and you end up with a convergent squint. So basically one eye deviates in okay towards the nose because there is this uh, association between accommodation and convergence and when you've got an eye that's really accommodating like crazy and then it, it can't cope that you, you find that the, the eye will then converge in and this is called uh, an esotro esotropia okay this is an esotropic squint an accommodative esotropia okay because it's it's associated with uh, accommodation and the way you would deal with that is to correct that hypermetropia as soon as possible. This will develop between the ages of um, two and four years old. So it's a fairly early onset. And, you know, this is, this is the type of thing that we can help with. We can provide glasses that will correct that hypermetropia. You may want to do some patching and exercises as well. The patching doesn't correct strabismus. The patching is there in case this eye becomes, if this eye is showing signs of amblyopia because of that deviation, then we patch the dominant eye, the good eye, we patch that and force the brain to start using that deviated eye and, uh, and obviously with the glasses in place you'll find that that eye will straighten up. 
and uh, hopefully the vision will be restored in that eye and if it's caught early enough it will be sorted that way. Another good way of dealing with issues of amblyopia is um, exercises. You know, there are exercises that can be administered to help um, the eyes move and, and, and work together properly. So to build up that motor fusion that we're talking about earlier on. The second um, cause is weak muscles. Okay, there are, there are six muscles that um, enable the eye to rotate and if there's a defect with one of those muscles and sometimes those muscles are the tension in those muscles are not quite right and you end up with one eye just deviating away because the tension of the muscles is insufficient to control it properly and in that case a surgery can be, dealt, can be done in order to correct for that. So the third cause is um, neurological neurological reasons and this is a bit more serious um, those muscles that control the eye movement are controlled by nerves and if those nerves become damaged in any way it will affect the movement of the eye as well so there are different types of palsies that will affect the different muscles in different ways so sometimes a palsy will cause um, a, an eye to deviate up or down or outwards or inwards, so it depending on which muscle is affected. So palsies, cerebral palsy is a problem. Viral infections such as meningitis can cause strabismus. Um, things like thyroid problems can be an issue as well. Diabetes um, can cause strabismus. That oxygen supply is, is not there because the, the blood vessels have, be, have deteriorated because of diabetes, then that will affect the eye movement as well. And then there's also things like um, tumors, which could be a cause for strabismus. So there could be some very serious issues going on. And if a, a squint develops very quickly, then I, I would say that that is very likely to be a pathological problem and they need to be referred to a hospital as soon as possible. So really that is, um, that is the subject in a, in a sort of a very brief manner. The, the different types of tropias which I'll just quickly go through. We have esotropia which we've just um, mentioned. We have exotropia that is when the, devia the deviation is divergent, it's away from the nose, so the eye is pointing outwards. And then you've got hypertropia, where the deviation is up. And then you've got hypotropia, where the deviation is down. And usually it's, it's problems with the nerve that influence this kind of tropias here. So when it comes to treatment of strabismus and phorias and tropias and all of this, um, the main thing is to correct the refractive error. Um, you can pr prescribe exercises to help the muscles work together to build up that motor fusion that is uh, involved in providing good binocular vision. Um, you may use patching which uh, then helps to alleviate the amblyopia. Uh, there may be surgery in some cases if it's a muscular problem. Sometimes you can prescribe prism, which then what prisms do is they redirect the light into the eye so that if there is a misalignment, that light is redirected in such a way to overcome that and enable the brain to provide good binocular vision with prism. So this is just a very brief overview and I, I hope it's not been too complicated. Um, and uh, in the next video we're going to be going back to subjective refraction where we'll be looking at the fan and block method of correcting astigmatism which again is quite a useful technique that can be used in the places that we will be working in the remote areas of the third world.